Welcome back to another episode of the Drone to 1K podcast. I'm your host, David Young. We're getting close to the end of season six here. We're on episode nine. Today, I'm going to be talking with Guillermo Wenzel of Drone Sky Visuals. And actually, I spoke to Guillermo on an earlier season of Drone to 1K. And so he is a repeat guest. But this time, he's going to talk about how he actually took his business from part-time, which is what he was doing before. And now he is working on it full-time. It is his 100% living. So he's going to tell us the story of how he went from that part-time gig, which he talked about last time, and how he's transitioned into doing this for his full-time job, uh, making this his 100% income and business. Very, very cool story. Guillermo is a very hardworking guy, has some great, great examples for us to learn from if you are wanting to take a drone business full-time. Now, Guillermo has worked in the construction industry for a while, so a lot of his work revolves around that and helping out those types of clients. So if that's something you're interested in or want to learn more about, this is going to be a great episode for you. He also dives into how he used Google Ads to increase his leads coming into his business, so you can learn a little bit about that as well. And as always, before we dive in, if you want a nice fluffy Drone Launch Academy t-shirt, just leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, screenshot the review, send it to me, david at dronelaunchacademy.com, and uh, I'll shoot you a t-shirt as a thank you for taking the time to do that. Again, we always just want honest reviews, so if you're enjoying it, tell people that. If you think this podcast sucks, you can say that as well. We'll send you a shirt either way. So appreciate you guys. Thanks for everyone listening. Let's get into the interview with Guillermo. Welcome back to another episode of the Drone to 1K podcast. I'm your host, David Young. Today, I have Guillermo Wenzel on the podcast of Drone Sky Visuals. Thanks for coming on, Guillermo. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, I was going to say, you might recognize Guillermo's name. We were looking back when he was last on the podcast and I initially had you on for season four, episode seven. So if you want to hear him talk about when he started his business in 2019, I interviewed him then when he's got his business from 2019 to 2021. And now it's uh, end of 2023. So we've got another full two years of growth under the belt and experience. And I'm going to be a seasoned veteran, business veteran for this. I think since then you've quit your full time, you've quit your job and done this gone full time, right? That's right. That's right. At the moment that we did the first podcast, I was grasping, I think my first K a month, something like that. Yeah. And you're on the end. From yeah, exactly. And now I went full throttle like three months ago. I quit my job. This was always a side gig until more or less three to five months. Gigs started coming in a lot and I started asking for my vacation days. But then they started asking like, why are you asking for vacation days on a Wednesday or a Tuesday? Like, dude, take a Friday or a Monday. You're like, mind your own business. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Like, oh, I, I have to do my own stuff. At some point, it got out of, it was going to get out of hand. So I tried to jump uh, before that happened. So I went straight with my boss and I talked to him. I told him, like, look, the drone business grew and this is what I want to do. I grew it up and this is like a milestone that I wanted and I want to keep on doing. And now here I am. What were you doing for your full time job before? I worked in a construction company, so okay. we used to do high-end stores and condos, and I started with them more or less at the same time that I started Drone Sky Visuals. That was in 2019. Okay. I was growing on both at the same time, but I created a drone division within the company. They're a yeah. Canadian company, and okay. uh, they opened an office here, and so I became the team leader for the drone division of the company here in the U.S., so actually, they used to fly me around for, I used to do Matterport scans for them. We bought a couple of drones within the company, a Mavic 2 Pro and a Navata when it came out because I bought mine on my side and I started, I didn't start flying the Avata on in outside like everybody else. I started flying it inside because I was at job sites and I had like, I don't know, 20 minutes in my hand and I went like, we have to use this drone for something. So I started flying within the stores and going up and down and oh, that's cool. the trains and the cradles and stuff. And they liked it for marketing and more, mostly for their clients. It worked pretty good for them. For the construction company, were you like in a marketing role or were you like doing like construction, but just also happened to start doing drone stuff too? No, I was, I was 
head on with construction. I was a project coordinator per project. You couple up a project manager and the project coordinator. That's the one that basically helps or assists the project manager. Mm -hmm. And that was my role. So we had three or four projects at a time down here in South Florida. And they saw what I used to do, what I started doing with the drones. Actually, yeah. I remember one time one of the directors was looking at posts in LinkedIn and he stopped in a post for a construction company down here. It's called Coastal, Coastal Construction. It's a pretty big one. And they said like, wow, it's how cool are these pictures? We, we have to take these ones. And I saw him and I told him like, wow, that drone pilot must be amazing. That was my picture. <laughs> that was my picture and these guys like nah you didn't do that so i showed them the whole construction site progression for a year and a half of that project and they went like oh, that's that's when they said yes to opening to buying the drones in the company that's hilarious you like literally had to do it for another construction company for them to be like oh okay yeah we'll do it too. yeah exactly and i, I was pushing them like I was bugging like a little kid with for for in Christmas, and these guys went no, 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 until they saw that. What do you think their hesitation was to move forward with it or to, to try it out? Usually, construction companies are very old school, so introducing technology into construction, it's depending on who makes the decision. So usually, I mean, construction people are like if. I've been doing this for 40 years and this is the way to do it. Okay? Right. They don't but, see any need to change. Yeah. But actually they started a BIM department within the construction company that was using, they tested out a spot from Boston Dynamics, pretty high tech robotics. So I went like, okay, if they're trying to include this and they're trying to include LiDAR and Matterport and a couple more stuff, I mean, drones, they go hand to hand in BIM modeling and projects. Yeah. So I started like to sweep under under the table, the drone topic and stuff. I kind of convinced the director of a BIM, but he told me, okay, if you're the one who has to push this, I mean, I can't push this because I'm way over my budget. I was basically on my own. And when I saw that, thank God he was swiping that in, right in my face. And, and... <laughs> That's awesome. So What's real quick, it? look, for non-construction people, BIM is building information management. Is that right? Or is it some modeling? Else? Modeling. modeling. Building informa information modeling, is that what it is? Yes, correct. Describe that. Describe that to us. Let's pretend, I mean, I've heard of BIM and I've, as far as like AutoCAD and some like, I don't know, Revit or whatever. I don't know what systems they use. I'm not deep into that world. But if I had no idea what it was, which I'm sure a lot okay. of people do, explain it to me real quick. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to go very basic. So yeah, perfect. BIM modeling consists of capturing all the information of, let's say, a specific site. Let's go for something very specific, a square, a store that's a, a, a perfect square, right? They have maybe a couple of columns, something like that. With BIM modeling, there's certain specifics that you can create. You can create a 3D modeling. You can create elevations reports on the floor, on the ceiling, and there's more advanced uses for that for but for what we were working on at the moment, uh, the 3D modeling was what we were trying to achieve to show to the clients. Okay, so it, it was, was a 3D model of the plans, right? Not the as built. No, actually of the as built. Oh, okay. So, so what we did is the process was like this. So we went in with the lighter camera. So basically the lighter camera, what does it, it shoots like between 3 million rays of light per each six minutes or something like that in a different lot. locations. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's basically, basically, it's a bounce of light that goes back and forth. Okay. It's just like a lasers space. everywhere, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You do the scanning of the space. Yeah. After that, you start processing it. And what we did in the process was whatever you saw in the paper plans. Okay. The architectural, that's basically where all the millwork and all the walls go, all the drywall, the ceilings and the floor with whatever floor they have, wood, tile, whatever, and the roofs um, with drywall and walls with concrete blocks or drywall too. Okay. We sh showed it in one plan. Afterwards, you have the plumbing, the mechanical, that's HVAC and the electrical. So we processed that and then we use augmented reality lenses. So it's basically for mm. construction. There's a company that like specified it for construction that it's a helmet with an AR glass. So mm -hmm. it's a transparent glass, but you see the plans in the glass. Okay. Onto the structure where it is. 
Exactly. So if you're standing oh, inside trippy. the construction site in the middle of the construction and you put your helmet on, okay, and you have your glasses on, the first thing that pops up is it's Windows, okay? Windows, I think we were uh -huh. using Windows XP. So you have the control in your hand. It's just like a robot. So you had the controls, you had the, win the Windows sign here, you click it, and suddenly a menu pops up in your hand. And you start seeing, you go project. You see it on top of your hands. Yeah. You see it in your hand. You're looking, you're looking at your hand and you see all the options here. So you, yeah, your finger becomes a digital finger. It's just like a touch screen. So you're touching, you're typing, whatever. And then you go into the model when you're in the model. Okay. You see it from outside, just exactly like in the movies, you stretch it, you zoom it, in, you zoom it out, you zoom it in suddenly. And there was an option. What we usually did was you zoom it up zoom it in so it becomes bigger. You go into the 3D model, then you have an option to see the different trades. So you have architectural, let's say architectural, plumbing, HVAC, and electrical. And you say, okay, I want to take out from what I'm looking at the floors and you click on it. It's just like when, just like when you're putting in the password and you have the little eye on uh, next to it and you click it and the password pops up. This is the same thing. So you clicked on it and suddenly the floor disappeared. But when you look at the floor, you see all the piping, all the electrical connections that you have beneath the floor. Uh. You do the same thing with the walls or the ceiling. And let's say you take off the ceiling, you see all the HVAC ducts all going, the grill. And this is from the LiDAR scans or is this from something else? This is processing between the LiDAR scans and the initial CAD files that we received. See, what they used to do is it's kind of a mix. It's like in simple English, you threw everything in a processor and it came out like that. So basically the architects give us the CAD files and we interlace them with the LiDAR scanning and yeah. we put it into the 3D model. Man, dude, that's pretty cool. Were you guys integrating drones into any of that stuff? Was all this more like the internal build out? So I was in the process of integrating LiDAR drones, but I left the company. So. You quit. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But I was able to integrate the Matterport scanning to the drone. So basically what I did is before they started buying the drones, I found an attachment in Alibaba for my Mavic 1. And what I did is I screwed the 3D camera for the 3D camera on top of the drone and I started scanning all around in exteriors and in exteriors. So you could walk inside and out and see it's basically like a, a 3D orthomosaic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's cool. So it's, All right, so your bit. Let's get to your business then. So you were doing that for construction work, which is pretty cool, using drones that way. And I like that you're able to use drones in like your career, and also then transition to doing it as an entrepreneur as well. So your drone business gave us. You know, we talked, I guess, on the last episode about when you first started up to about 2021. So maybe you can give like just a quick recap of that, and then take us from like you know 2021 to now okay so drone sky visual started with the initial markets construction basically because i was there and i had kind of the connections right. if i didn't yeah. know somebody that somebody knew somebody else real estate look most of us started with real estate and at some point you want to get far from real estate because there's a lot of i mean the common opinion is that it's a very saturated market but after COVID that Florida boomed, I think the saturation went down because it's been going up. That's my understanding of the market right now. So as most drone pilots that got into the business was trying to get out of real estate. And right now, I, I don't want to say most of my calls, but a significant part of my deals are real estate. So I had that. I started with events. I did once I did a gender reveal drop with a solenoid that I attached to the top of a drone and I. Oh, that's cool. That was pretty nice. What did you drop from the drone? Like some organic think paper. Like, oh, okay. 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 The doctor sent me the gender. So I just <laughs> went. No pressure. Through. Exactly. And it was a friend of mine. So he was looking at me like, you know, but you're not going to say anything, right? And he, <laughs> he stared mute looking at me like, do you have anything to say to me? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? For all right, So I've got five kids and uh -huh. uh, when we had our fourth kid with the first four were boys all in a row. It's a lot. But we did, you know, the gender reveal thing for the fourth one. And what they did was they, I don't know, they got the person at the store to put either powder or papers. I think it was, might've been like little bits of like confetti or paper in the balloon. And then they blew the balloon up. It was a black balloon. So you couldn't like see through it. They made it really big and they flew it up. And the way we did it was I took my, I think it was like a DJI Air or like a Mavic Air 2 or something. And I just flew the drone propellers into the balloon so that it would pop. Okay. <laughs> it, kept, it kept like 
pushing the balloon away from the drum because like, <laughs> the air was blown. So I was having a hard time hitting it. We finally awesome. hit it, popped it. Yeah. And, uh, and then all the blue stuff came out. But yeah, I was, I was trying to incorporate drums into the gender reveal, but it was not as, oh, not as cool nice. as I thought. That's cool. Exactly. I like your solenoid idea better. <laughs> I bought the solenoid like for seven bucks in Alibaba too. It came like two months later, but it, it worked until like a month awesome. and a half ago that I was trying to test it again and it died. But I'm going to I'm going to do one on my own. It's pretty easy. It's cool. So you got these rent, like different gigs, like real estate. You said you were doing some construction stuff, too. Yeah, I started no? with that. So as time passed by, I started like popping out. I mean, I started receiving requests from different markets that, truth be told, I never imagined that they were going to come out. Like, well, how are they finding you? What was your marketing Look, strategy? My my marketing strategy, my Trojan horse is Google Ads. Google Ads is Trojan. amazing. Like everybody, I mean, all of us, if we don't know where to look, you go to Google. Okay. Yeah. You go to Google and you search drone, uh, aerial photography in Miami, in my case, or aerial photography, wherever. And basically, I started learning about Google Ads through this. Okay. So you have to learn how to configure your campaigns, how to do it. And once you do that, it becomes a bidding game. Okay. So you're bidding against other people with the same keywords or more or less the same background. So that's more or less how I got my clients. That was like my top tier. Afterwards, uh, the others were in marketplaces. And there's an English marketplace called Bark and you others like drone base, droners, drone base. Now it's called Z, I think. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Those guys and basically referrals and something that I didn't like was going to networking events. You didn't networking, like that? It's not that I didn't like it. I wasn't comfortable like approaching people like, hi, yeah. I'm Guillermo. I, I fly drones. Nice to meet you. Do you, do you need one? And <laughs> well, like, maybe if you don't go and do it like that. Exactly. No, but I was at first I was super awkward. It was very awkward. And people like kept looking at me like, oh, okay. So I started like, okay, I can't do that. I had a friend that was in sales and he told me like, what are you doing? You're scaring people off. So on, a little strong. at least there's no question about, you know, what you do. Yeah, of course they go. And, I mean, they threw me that look of what's wrong with this guy. I mean, this is a weird nerd. That's so, hilarious. I started going to that. And after, I mean, a few years. You were going to them for a few years? No, no. I mean, as years passed by, okay, oh, okay. I, I got my, I kind of got my ne networking talk more or less. Now, oh. I think if I see back in time and somebody would approach me like that, I would do or I would run or maybe I would punch him in the face. Maybe. <laughs> but you know what? I just want to give you some kudos. A lot of people wouldn't even bother or wouldn't even push themselves into a situation where they're uncomfortable. You know what I mean? But you, it's... by putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation and doing it over and over again, you kind of figured out, okay, well, that creeps people out and that doesn't work. So maybe I should try something different. You know, like you learned and adapted and figured it out, you know? Exactly. At that time, also, I didn't have the beard. I had like this weird mustache, so it looked even <laughs> weirder. So <laughs> it's getting better. No, I got to stop. <laughs> See, that's what happened at that time. I, I started <laughs> talking and I didn't stop, but I didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah, I was talking about whatever. Thank yeah. God those times have passed already. People love to talk about themselves. So sometimes if you don't know what to say. Just what do you do? Oh, cool. Do you like that? How did you get started with that? You just keep asking them questions so you don't have to talk. Exactly. So there's something that helped me a lot with talking and networking networking events there is this author i don't remember his name and his book and his theory it's called jobs be done the theory that he he talks about that he implements is that you need to ask your lead or your prospect at that moment what are their their pain points what are they looking for what do they want to accomplish with this what do they want to get to with this it's anthony olwick that's right oh it is that's anthony the, okay cool. exactly so that guy, for me, he helped me a lot. And if you look him up in YouTube, he talks like very lightly, like he's very easy to talk to. And he talks to in a way that it's not overwhelming or you're not harassing somebody. Don't put off the desperate vibes, basically. Exactly. He tries to understand what do you do first and what are the prop, what are the challenges that you're facing? Which are the possible solutions? And within these possible solutions, 
how can my solution benefit your pain point? It's like learn how to walk before you go running. For That's me, it helps a lot. He has some like very interesting podcasts. There's a lot of people, there's like five or six guys that I've heard in different podcasts that interview him. Every interview, he has like something new to give. And he, this is a guy that knows how to talk and he knows what he's doing about it. 21, if you can remember revenue wise, walk us through kind of, I mean, I think you said when I interviewed you last time, you're kind of just now cracking the, or just then cracking the $1,000 a month range back in 2021. But now you're doing it full time. I think you said you've been doing that for a few months now, right? So, you know, can you walk us through how the business grew from, you know, 2021 to being able to let you support yourself full time? In 2021, I started passing the the 1K. It was very inconsistent in between 1K. Sometimes it was a good month. You could get two, three. Sometimes it came back down. I remember yeah. there was a month that I didn't even do the 1K. So I was like, wow, I have to. I have to pay the marketing and, and I got to take money out of my pocket. So, but you're uh, running that still, but nothing was, nothing had converted. Exactly. So it was like you average it all. And at the end you have like your year average for what yeah. you do and what you say you cover for, for less, uh, less lean months. Exactly. Exactly. Now I'm curious, how much were you spending on Google ads every month on average? Do you think during this time? I remember I started on Google ads with, it was 10 bucks a day. It was 10 bucks. Okay. A, Not was, a lot. No, that was 300 bucks, uh, 300 bucks a month. So I started receiving calls through Google ads. And the truth is the first time I started paying for ads, it paid off in its second day. I got a deal for almost double of what I was paying that moment, 600 bucks. And afterwards, at that moment, I went like, okay, Google Ads is staying. I was testing other platforms at the time. Facebook didn't work as much for me. I don't know if somebody else had different experiences, but in my experience, I never got a deal through Facebook. Facebook is a little bit trickier. I mean, we use Facebook and Google a lot. Yeah. And Google's good for people who are actively searching for what you have. You know what I mean? So if I'm like, if I'm typing in drone photographer Miami, there's a good chance that I'm looking for someone like that. Whereas Facebook, it's a little bit more like interest based. So you have, you know, nobody's actively saying, hey, Facebook, I want this person. I mean, not usually, they're usually scrolling in their feed. And so the ad has to be a little bit different for them to be like, oh, who is this guy? Oh, what does he do? It's like a, it's a little bit of a longer or different type of process to convert someone into a customer. Exactly. It's different. I mean, for Google, you see hot leads. I had the same experience that I had with Facebook. I had with Instagram. I use this Instagram as part of my portfolio. I tested running ads in Instagram and in two or three years, I've gotten, I think one, two deals. Oh, really? So, yeah. So I cut it off and it's, I mean, it's still my portfolio. I update it every week but I'm not running ads on it. So that's basically it. I mean, I'm still searching every week. I'm still searching for new lead generation generation platforms outside the drone based ones. Like, yeah, uh, like, like droners and exactly. Correct. Are you still doing like Bark and Thumbtack and those kind of platforms? Yeah, actually Bark. I've been using Bark for two years now and it's been consistent. I mean, it's my second in command after after Google Ads. I started with Thumbtack like a bit more than a month ago and I sent them an email to see because they have like photography searches for photography or for wedding photography or event photography. So I sent them an email to see if they could open another feature called drone photography, but they yeah. ha they haven't gotten back to me because yeah. most of the of the leads that I've received they just want a usual uh, a normal regular photography. photography. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For us, it's like a ground photographer. So so because these Bark and Thumbtack for people who are not familiar, mm -hmm. they're sort of like gig marketplaces almost, or like oh you need a specific job done, a photographer, a plumber, or whatever like household things sometimes. 
you no. can find anyone on there. Is it, or I don't know if it's plumbers, but it's stuff kind of like different types of tasks and gigs, but like drones can be included in that. We'll go there to look for that. Yeah, exactly. It's like that. They have a, a large variety of uh, services that they offer, but they have drone services included there. Drone aerial photography. They call it aerial, yeah. aerial photography. It's been working pretty good for me. It doesn't bring as much revenue as Google ads, but it's still there. And then. With Bark, you have to, isn't it that you like, you buy credits and you use up the credits when you like apply to the job? Is that right? Correct. That's how it works. It's it's very basic. It's very simple. You receive a lead from somebody that's looking for your services near you and they give you a short description of what they're looking for and you just contact them via phone or text or email or through the platform. I try to do all four of them at once. So to see... Because the clients are always different. I mean, there's some that uh, answer via text. There's some that pick up the phone. There's some that just uh, answer via email. So I throw all the arrows I have to them. <laughs> and then do you know what, how much it costs you to get like a client on Bark? How much oh, credits oh. it's going to cost to, I'm assuming you don't win every one you contact. It's not bid based. Like you don't w win the lead. So I think if there's three of us that receive the lead, uh, all three of us are going to pay with our credits for it. I think it's a matter of who contacts them first. And Right, right. So they're going to pick one of you, you know what I mean? Correct, exactly. And they have a, a monthly subscription or you can pay as you go, however you prefer. And the range price for leads, it's around 30 and 15 credits, more or less. That's like, you can count it like around two bucks a credit, more or less. Okay. So like 30 to 60 bucks a lead. Yeah, more or less. Okay. What's like an average job like that you would do? How much Look, would you charge maybe? Okay. For my jobs, I break it down. I usually, when I started, I used to offer a package like, okay, all in one. You want, you want drone photography, you want drone videography, everything. If they wanted photography and video. And editing, I charge like uh, 300 for photography and video and 200 extra for editing. But at some point, I realized that everybody requested a breakdown. Like, okay, how much is it for only photography or only videography? Yeah. First, I broke it down. And at some point, I started to realize that at least here in the market in Miami, I was too cheap. I was basically low bowling. I ramped up a bit my prices and right now I offer for aerial photography, let's say an hour. My hour for aerial photography, it's 200. For video, it's 200. If they want a photography and video, it's 300 mm -hmm. per hour. If it's uh, FPV interiors for listings for real estate, it's 500 bucks an hour. The editing is 200 per hour too, if they want extras like voiceovers, I, I charge for 500 words of voiceovers. It's 50 bucks. If you want, uh, extra 200 words, it's 25 bucks. And for interviews with microphones and settings and production, it depends on the time. Also, that's more of a tailor-made price. Gotcha. But Everything that you're doing is several hundred dollars and up, no matter what. Yes, there's oh. also the ortho mosaics. I'm mm -hmm. charging 30 bucks an acre. And if they want thermal or other type of service, that's more tailor-made. I don't have like an established price for that. You have a thermal drone? Yes, I have a Mavic 2 Enterprise. Gotcha. So paying 30 bucks for a lead, if you're going to win it, even if you're going to get them half the time, that's going to be worth it because it'll lead to $100 worth of work. Not smart. So... 2021 goes by. How did you do in 2022 business wise? Do you remember kind of how you were doing revenue or I guess how comfortable you, you feel sharing detail wise? 2022 is when money wise, the company started to ramp up and I got some of my best or my biggest clients in 2022. I started doing productions. I started, people started calling me for films. I remember bigger real estate gigs that what I had at the beginning, like they started paying for the whole combo for, okay, photography, videography. They started asking for photo interior photography as well. So I teamed up with a friend of mine. She comes in and helps me out. So we team up for that. In construction, I was already getting some yearly contracts, but 2022 got me some bigger ones. I got like, they were expanding a big mall here in Miami, Ball Harbor Shops. 
I got that one. Yeah, where these people find all these new deals, like the construction thing. Are they finding you through Google ads or word of mouth or what? A construction was more word of, word of mouth because of my background. The other ones were mostly Google ads. Google ads, some of them were Bark, but most were Google ads. All of the clients that are not US based that I got a few that year were all through Google ads. I got clients from Australia, from the Netherlands, from really, yeah, from Haiti. I remember they called me once for something that we didn't end up doing. It was like surveillance for a VIPs in Haiti. It was like to go to Haiti to do that. I wanted to do the consultant side of it because he wanted to set up the company there. Basically, what he wanted to do is as soon as a VIP arrived to the airport, he wanted drones following the convoy to wherever they were going. But it had like a lot of details, like I needed a drone that flew more than an hour without the battery running out. That was the first one that popped up in my head. Then the other one, what if a radar catches it and... I've heard of EMPs or stuff like that in this, these type of countries. And I'm not there. I wanted to get there, but at some point, this guy didn't want to pay anymore. So I went like, no worries. It's okay. Uh, it, it would have been an amazing, a very cool gig, but it didn't go through. Interesting. A, a big portion of my international clients came that year. That year. I did. I liked the most. It's their client is a documentary channel. I can't say it out loud, but it's involving animals and earth and all this type of stuff. But the producer is in Australia. Oh, so the first time I, I did a production for them was here in Miami. They called me like three weeks after that. They flew me to Laredo, Texas, to the border. That was a handful because I had to contact like three different agencies, one federal and two locals for police and flight permits uh, beyond lands. And it, it was a lot of back and forth with email. It was pretty cool. And you were doing all this while you were working full time? Yeah, of course. I was chopping up my vacation days like crazy. Oh my goodness, it sounds real so busy. What were you making percentage wise of like your full time income? Like how much was the drone stuff bringing in on the side? Was it like starting to approach what you were doing at your full time job? Or did Look, you have to take a pretty big drop when you switched over? It was very inconsistent at, let's say, the first Q and a half of 2022, like I wasn't expecting what was going to happen. But suddenly I remember in July, I doubled my salary. Oh, so for the month of July, you made more than you doubled what you would normally make. In my nine to five. Yeah, exactly. Like you equaled it so that basically you're getting double the pay or it was twice as much as you. No, it was twice as much. So whatever I okay. received, what I, whatever I received in my main job, yeah. I had three times that in July. I went like, wow, <laughs> what's happening here? Wow. Okay, sweet. Oh, that was cool. Like August went down. I remember like half of what I made the previous month. So I went like, okay, maybe that's only a spike. I came again in September and in November. And I went like, oh, oh really? Okay. okay, this is getting serious. So another pain came into play. That was time management. I started like pushing all of my gigs after five or after four or weekends. So yeah. I remember like from more or less from October, until July of this year, most surely I had, if without exaggerating, more or less three or four weekends. I remember that I didn't have anything gig. one of the days. Wow. So was it a little bit of a breath of fresh air when you, I'm sure it's somewhat nerve wracking, but you quit your job, at least you get a lot of that time back to be able to budget yeah. yourself a little bit more spread out. At first, yes. Like the first day it was, it was weird. Like, okay, yeah. what, am gonna, what am I going to do again? <laughs> what, am, what am I going to do now? So yeah. I started thinking and I started writing down, I have to get back on the horse with marketing, okay, with my financials. I have to ramp up sales because it's not like, okay, I cover my expenses and that it, that's it. What happens if next, next month I go pretty lean on my sales? So how much do I have to save? How, how much do I need in my savings or the company account? Mm -hmm. account for something like that. Like, for example, right now I'm in that point where I have all my di data collected with intervals of how did I do every, every month of each year since I started. And mm -hmm. usually November's and January's are the worst, have been regularly the worst I mean, the worst months of each yeah. year for me. I have Service to businesses, I think, slow down if it makes you feel better. I've heard from a few other buddies who have drone service companies and they're like, Dude, November is slow, like pulling teeth. It is, it is, it is. 
So I have to account for that. So I, at that time, I had two people in my editing team. I had to fire one. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't performance based. It was in the financial state of my company. Yeah. Was it just couldn't keep them on? Yeah. Exactly. Correct. I started. I think we, I think we phrase it as I had to let them go instead of I had to provide. <laughs> yes. I yeah. Thank you. Went like, down there to their face. No. You're fired. She was very good at her work. She was super, a uh, super nice person, but. I, I, I couldn't afford her at that time. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah. If in the future I have rehired somebody for that position, I'd call her directly, instantly, without a blink. So are those like staff members you had? Like they're working for you full time or they're just kind of you paid them That's, as you win? Or, I guess, how did that work? I subcontract right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right now I subcontract. At some point I'm going to have to hire because right now I have to cut myself in seven pieces. The sales guy, the drone guy. The editing guy, thank God, no, uh, but depends. I mean, because the girl that's editing for me, she doesn't know how to work, for example, drone deploy stuff or that yeah. type of data information. So that's something that I have to do. They like or data stuff? That side of the pie, I rebranded. So I contracted a website designer and I updated my website. I started getting into new markets. So I had another slice of the pie that was called expand. I started bidding for drone light shows for government contracting. So I started the government contracting. If you don't like paperwork, I mean, they have <laughs> federal or state or what? All of them, all of them. I wanted to go, yeah. I wanted at that moment, I started like investigating because I didn't know too much about it. But when I got into it, it's a whole new world. They have an amazing and huge budget, but the gateway is paperwork. It's files and files and files and files and files and files and it's never ending. If you pass that gate, they help you. I was going to these sessions for small businesses. So they give you a coaching, mentoring. If you, yep. for example, government contractors request that you have two years of government contracting experience. So I went like, I'm new. It's just like when you go out of college and this new job tells yeah. you, like, okay, you need five years of experience. Like, I'm out of college. How am I going to do that? Yeah. How do you, the qualification to become a get federal con or a government contractor is have contracting experience? It's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, they have a program so you can collaborate with another company. It's basically the same as the mentoring program, but they basically take you under their wing. It's a partner in the business. Gotcha. I was starting with the FPVs, so I was super excited. All I wanted to do was fly the FPV, but paperwork came. It never so stopped. still working on it? Every time I have a gig, I go out, I do the, the normal flights that I have to do, and then I take out the, the FPV and start like flying around and they start asking like, wow, what does that do? And I give them like a short explanation of them. I show them a video That's and cool. they go like, wow, this is super cool. Blah, blah. Yeah. But, but the thing, I think it's FPV is not for everyone. If, if, I mean, some people have told me that FPV videos are too aggressive. Like they're too fast. You're not concentrated in what the video is showing you're concentrating in the pilot not crashing it depends i mean you can fly fpv slow too you know like yes but i mean what's a fun way there <laughs> yeah well i'm just saying like if you're doing it for like cinematography type like for that yes. one big shots you know for that but, yes um, for production yeah but you like it i wanted to do fpv i haven't done a much of it but they busted some out at our live event that we did dusty led a group doing that it looks awesome dusty had his custom built ones there few people had their Avada. It's cool. That's very cool. cool. I was going to say, going into 2023, you've been working for yourself for a few months. What's the best thing about full-time working for yourself? And what's been the most challenging thing working for yourself full-time? Okay. The best thing about working for myself, before I say this, for whoever's listening, you have to understand that the work hours don't go down. Okay. Here, what you do is you manage your time. There's nights that I'm working until 2 a.m. in the morning or something like that. I can be working long hours, sending emails, paperwork, doing whatever, but I can manage my time. That's the best thing about running your business. If you're very passionate about it, about it and you like it a lot, it's like adrenaline. You want more and more and more and more and more and more. And I remember when I was in my previous job that my boss used to tell me like, okay, you need to call all this bunch of people to find quotes, do whatever, blah, blah, blah. And for me, it was like, 
God, why? I'm just looking at my watch to see, waiting for 5 p.m. Now, whatever phone number or name or card I find, I call, I don't want to say harass, but yes, you sweet talk them. You find their pain points. You try to help them. At some point, you start getting not as a salesman. I think that the best sale is a consultant sale. So you give them options. So these are the options that you can have to solve your problem or to ease a bit what you're st struggling with. That's been the best pitch that I've had in this period or this year, actually. I think your point about, well, number one, I remember like managing your time, Ryan. You probably work more, but you enjoy it more sometimes, I think. Like all of your activity, if I work harder, I have more opportunity for myself. Whereas in some jobs, especially, you know, I used to have a government job. It's like I could kill myself working like and just do like as much as I could, right? And I would make the same amount as the other guy who's just slacking off, you know, doing arts and crafts at his desk. The only incentive to do a really good job is just to have self-respect and to make your boss happy, I guess, or maybe get promoted to something else. But there was no real financial incentive to work harder, right? And it's like, oh, cool. Like you said, like if I call all these companies and do all this stuff, you don't really have a dog in the fight one way or another if you do get those or don't get those customers because like unless you're getting a piece of it or something but when you work for yourself it's like every time you land a new thing or you grow it's like directly impacts you and your life and you're like oh heck yeah well, you know let me do this more let me get more of this so i think you're right so what was the most challenging thing what was the most challenging part of working for yourself the most challenging part is the first one i'm horrible at taxes but i want to learn i have an accountant but i want to learn you get a tax guy yeah but besides that the most challenging thing is it's not landing clients it's diversifying and find in open in in my case that i'm opening new markets starting to open these markets in my case i have like three types of markets the first ones the ones that come regularly the construction real estate events the second part of my business are the markets that i didn't expect the large productions landscaping lawsuits that type of stuff and the third one is the ones that I want to open, like the drone light show or government contracting. That basically government contracting is the same, but through another. On your own at the same time, you spread out, try to spread out in too many different areas or too many different courses or too many different, you know, things at once. It's hard to be successful. So I think, you know, tackling them one at a time slowly or slow enough to where you're doing them well, you know. Exactly. And I think after that, something that I haven't gotten yet, but it's going to the point that you just said, I'm going to grow to a point that I can't handle everything for myself. And I think this goes not for our industry, but for every person on earth that opens a business is growth. You have to have like a plan. So what happens if I get to this point or I get, I mean, you get too many gigs. What are you going to do? Are you going to say, no, I'm busy? Or yes, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to expand my team. And you're going to get a handful of people that you trust and you know they have the capability and the abilities to perform the work and to deliver the same quality that you've been working on from day one. I choose growth, but I'm anxious. I mean, I'm trying to have my plan for it, but I know that a plan is a plan. A plan is not reality. So yeah, I, but it's better to have a plan that you're working towards versus making it all up as you go along. You know Exactly. Yeah, you're yeah. not winging it. I've done a lot of winging it. I was actually just talking about this today. I'm like, hey, maybe we should get like a plan and budget for 2024 and like have some month by month what we're going to try to accomplish because I'm more of like a, oh yeah, let's just go. Let's try this. Let's try this. And it's sometimes good to have a little bit more structure in place, you know? Well, you know what helped me a lot? I have, I made like a little list of objectives that I do every, every December or starting January. So in month by month, by month, how many gross sales do I want to do? Yep. How many transactions do I want to get? How many leads do I want? How many prospects are, am I going to reach? How many clients am I going to close? So I do it month by month, by quarter, by semester. And it's that data, you have a use for it, of course. But I think something that people don't tell you that I learned when I started doing it is that you have something to look for when you see that objective. Like, for example, every first of every month, I open my objectives list and I go, okay, I have to make this amount of money and this amount of transactions. I have to contact 
this amount of prospects and get this amount of leads and close this amount of clients. You have a goal and you start the game on that month to get to where you want. So it's like, it, it gives you a push. It's more adrenaline yeah. for the show. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. And, you're, and I like how you're breaking it down enough to be like, not just, all right, I'm going to do this much in sales, but you're like, all right, how do I get to that number? I, I have to do this and do this. And they're breaking it into the individual actions that you have to take that are going to lead up that. Hopefully, right? You know, you can't predict it exactly, but you know, at least, okay, cool. So now I feel like, oh, I've only made two calls today, but I'm going to need to contact 200 people, you know, this month or whatever it is, you know, you're like, all right, well, I need to get on the phone or go out and meet some people or whatever if you're behind. Exactly. And wait, hey, you can break it way more. You can break, break it in strategies. What are you going to do to use that strategy? It's pretty complex, but you can do it. If you start with it, it gives you an extra push for it. Oh, that's great, man. Well, Guillermo, we've been talking for like an hour now. So I love getting all the details of your story. If people want to reach out to you and say, hey, or whatever, what's the best way that they can check out your work? It sounds like you were on Instagram. So I have my Instagram account is at dronesskyvisuals.com. My website is dronesskyvisuals.com. And there you can see part of our work and even landing pages and everything. And if you want to shoot me an email, if you need, before I found you guys, I was all alone in this, in forums and finding stuff. And this could be a very lonely market until you start reaching out. So if you can reach me out directly to my email, it's gwenzel at dronesskyvisuals.com. Even give me a call if you want. My phone is 786-553-3665. I oh man, throwing the phone number on here. All right. Of course, definitely. I mean, if I would have help from day one, I would have loved it. And if I can give that for future drone pilots or business owners in this market, I'd love to help. Oh, dude, that's awesome. Well, careful what you wish for, because I feel like you're going to get some calls. <laughs> but, uh, that's that's fantastic. So, Guillermo, thanks so much, dude. It's great hearing your story. I hope you can keep pace with your growth. It's a good problem to have, though, growing, you know, having so much work to do that you're trying to keep up with it. So, man, maybe we'll have to have you back on in two years and hear about all those sick government contracts that you've got landed in the bag and see how we're doing then. We'll see in two years. I hope so. I really <laughs> hope so. And I really hope that the good problems start coming keep coming in, not the bad one. Yeah, that's right. Thanks so much. No, thank you very much for having me.